Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlin. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I am Tim Erlin, uh, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And today, I am joined by the illustrious Graham Cluley. Uh, by way of introduction, here are some things that I happen to know about Graham. Uh, he's a blogger. He's a highly acclaimed blogger, in fact, and he has his own podcast as well. Uh, Graham has also been in the industry for whew, more than 20 years. We'll say more than 20 years as a starting point. So he has a lot of knowledge and experience. And today, uh, we're here to talk a little bit about security awareness. So welcome, Graham. Thank you very much, Tim. Pleasure to be here. Excellent. And uh, Graham, would you say that security awareness is something that you're passionate about? Is that an, an accurate description? Well, as passionate as an Englishman can ever be about anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have to start from that sort of low base, I suppose. But yeah, I think security awareness is really important. I mean, I think one of the things that I realized early on, I started off as a programmer writing antivirus software back in the early 1990s. Um, but as time went on, I realized, well, it can't just be programmers and developers and people with neckbeards talking to other programmers and developers and people with neckbeards. We need to raise general awareness of computer security issues because computers were entering our lives more and more um, and more people, you know, it's unbelievable that that sort of happened over the last 30 or 40 years. And uh, you know, everyone needs to get on board and understand these issues in order to better protect ourselves. So is that is that a, a a change in your attitude towards information security that you developed over time, or is it is there is there an incident that occurred or something specific that drove you to sort of move away from programming towards more more general awareness as a as a goal? I I think um I think it's a variety of things. I think first of all, what I saw was more and more people were using computers, and obviously we now have this situation for the last 10, 15 years or so of everyone carrying a computer in their pocket and being slightly addicted to it and obsessed with it. And so that, from that point of view, it became important. But one of the things that we did at the uh, first security company I worked for, the, my very first job was uh, as a Windows programmer at Dr. Solomon's Software, who wrote, uh, I worked for Alan Solomon and we wrote an antivirus program. And one of the things which he believed in was that all the programmers should spend at least one day every month on the tech support desk. Mm -hmm. So your job wasn't just to write the software. Your job was also to understand the problems which customers were having. And it may be that you heard those problems and you then went back and thought, oh, I can fix that with a piece of code. But also you understood the implications of the mistakes and the design decisions which you made when you were writing that software as well. So it really put me in touch with the regular users. And I like to think that to this day, I'm putting myself in that position. I'm putting myself into those shoes and thinking, well, what do they think? What is, what's the language they understand? What are their issues? And, and hopefully I'm able to address them and, like I said, make them more secure online. So when you, when you think about awareness, I, I mean, I, my perspective comes from, you know, being a vendor. So I've spent my, my career. Mm. Um, a little shorter than yours, perhaps, but primarily talking to large enterprises about information security products. And that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll admit my own bias. That gives me a bias towards technology solutions um, and a kind of anti-bias towards awareness. Right. But from your perspective, you, you have this, essentially the opposite perspective, it seems. Um, do, do you think that technology plays a role there? Or how do you think the two interact, technology and awareness? That might be a better way to ask the question. Well, I, I think technology is a vital component. I, I, I you know, I would, I would not want anyone connecting to the internet without security solutions in place. I wouldn't want anyone running their business without software and hardware, which are doing the hard job of filtering out most, most of the threats or warning you if something has gone wrong because, you know, computer technology can do an awfully good job at that. 
And uh, it, it always galls me. I was recently in a Twitter conversation where, for instance, uh, someone was running a poll and they said, uh, tell me which antivirus you're using. And loads of people from the security industry said, I'm not running any antivirus at all. Mm -hmm. And I replied saying, well, I feel like I'm the weird odd one out here because I am running antivirus software. And I think, you know, I think it's a responsible thing to do. And even if we can protect our own computers or we're comfortable with that attack happening on our computer, that you know, maybe we can recover from that. You still want to protect that computer because it could be used as a launch pad to launch attacks against other people's computers. So it's a responsible thing. It's a bit like, you know, vaccinating yourself, for instance. It's a responsible thing as part of the community to make sure that you don't end up vulnerable. Uh, and you don't end up infected with something. So technology, fantastic from that point of view, but it's not the entire solution. Ultimately, a lot of breaches occur because of human error. And it may be that people are offered a, a cleverly socially, socially engineered link to click on. It may be an alluring file name attached to an email. It may be that someone on your reception desk has allowed a phone call to come through and they've passed it through to your desk and they, they said, oh, it's the department of such and such from the government who are ringing you. And so you believe that as soon as you begin the conversation and you may give away information. So I think the human element is an essential component as well. And often I think it gets overlooked because it's considered too difficult, particularly from those who have a more sort of engineering or technology bent because their typical answer is, I'll get a piece of software, I'll install it, and that's the problem gone. But in fact, there's this more squelchy human element as well, which we also need to address. And part of fixing that is through awareness. And, and you know, it occurs to me that it's not just technology versus awareness. There's a business aspect to it, too, because... When you were saying that that you know the the engineer's response is is that they'll build a piece of software, uh, I, I think that the business's response is is often well I can't make any money out of that. Right. Um, awareness is although there's a certainly an industry there for security training, there isn't really a a huge uh, economic boon in educating the average public about uh, information security topics. Right. No, um, at least it's, it would be hard, I think, to put, to put a monetary figure on that, although it'd obviously be good for countries. I, I, I think it would be, and, and organizations to do that. I think it, it's difficult to, to really calculate that kind of thing. But it's, it certainly is the case that more and more companies over time have begun to recognize the importance of securing their organizations and securing their staff as well and raising awareness of these threats simply because they've grabbed, you know, they've had awareness in a way they've, they've had those alerts from reading the media. And so C level directors who previously wouldn't have given a damn about computer technology and security issues now do care about these things because they don't want to be the one appearing on CNN explaining why their data got stolen. They don't want the one to be grabbed by the regulators and asked why on earth weren't you properly protecting that data and why wasn't it sufficiently encrypted or why didn't you have multiple levels of authentication in place in order to defend it. So Indeed. awareness <laughs> works in different ways. It's not just against individuals. There's also raising awareness amongst companies as well to do a better job. And I think it's a reality these days that that those executives don't want to be fired for a, a an information security breach. It happens, well, right? It's a reality. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there, there have been classic cases of, of this happening. I mean, one would be something like Target or uh, Equifax as well, where people have lost their jobs because yes. the the damage done maybe to the brand or maybe to the share price or whatever is so substantial that you know basically people want a head on a plate. And they want and it's to a fascinating it's a, it's a fascinating transition we've seen from information security you know breaches being impactful to maybe the the information security staff and then maybe the CISO and now finally the the rest of the executive team and, and p potentially the CEO as well that's a shift yeah. that's occurred over time that there, there's no excuse now not to care there's no excuse now not to be asking questions of your CISO uh, and there's, there's no excuse not to be listening to them when they're saying we really need some more budget to protect our organization because there are plenty of tales now of companies who've been basically bankrupted 
or near as near as good enough because mm-hmm. of data breaches. You know, w- one of the things I say is that you can spend an absolute lifetime building up the brand and reputation of your organization, but it may only take minutes to destroy it through a data breach. And then how many years, if at all, will you have an opportunity to actually recover? People have got long memories. And yeah, well, <laughs> we're still using Target as an example, well, for example. Well, yeah, right, exactly. Um, and that was an interesting one as well, because, of course, uh, with with some of these breaches, it's not the case that you had to be purchasing online. I think there was a... I, I rem- I'm old enough to remember when Amazon first popped up and, you know, and ordering my first book there and or going on eBay for the first time and thinking, will this really work? You know, I'm going to buy something online. That's now become traditional. But, of course, we see these breaches, like with TK Maxx as well, where the hack actually happens at the point of sales machine. And so you went in with a physical credit card thinking, well, this is safe. I'm not on the Internet. But in fact, your payment card details still get stolen and the fraud occurs. Will you be attending the upcoming RSA conference in San Francisco? Visit Tripwire at booth 6253 in the North Expo, where we'll be recognizing the people involved in making the Internet a safer place for everyone. People protecting people with cybersecurity. Also, catch Tim Erlen, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy, and Dave Meltzer, CTO at Tripwire, for their session on managing risk amid environmental sprawl and growing responsibilities. It's on Tuesday, February 25th at 2.20 p.m. And Travis Smith, Principal Security Researcher at Tripwire, will be there also for his session, Red Teaming for Blue Teamers, a practical approach using open source tools. That's on Wednesday, February 26th at 2 p.m. The RSA conference is the place to be. We'll look for you there and find out more at tripwire.com. You brought up an interesting point uh, a few minutes ago that I wanted to go back to because I, I think it was particularly germane to this conversation. You were talking about the uh, the enterprise versus the individual in terms of security awareness. Mm. And one of the things that's really changed that should make, I think, the individual security awareness more relevant to the enterprise is the connection between my personal devices and my corporate devices. Right. Uh, even if it's not a, a, a technical connection, the fact that I do work on personal devices, whether it's my mobile device or, you know, a, a laptop, and I do work on my, my corporate devices, it, it becomes a concern for the enterprise how I secure my personal technology, right? It does. Uh, it becomes very complicated. And, uh, you know, everyone is working longer hours than ever before. Everyone's expected to be available all the time. We're all being daft and checking our emails at 11 o'clock at night, you know, terrified that the boss has asked us to do something and wanting to get ahead of the next day. Um, and you may, of course, also be sharing those devices with family members and security isn't always as strong as it is on the corporate locked down device. You may even have a situation in your organization where your official work device has been so locked down by the IT team, it's a complete pain in the neck to try and log in to the company and you're thinking, oh, this will be so much easier if I just email this piece of work, for instance, to my personal Gmail or Hotmail address. I'll work on it on my personal computer and then email it back into the organization. Yeah. And there are risks associated with that kind of behavior. Yeah, there's a, I've, I've heard the, the classic example of you know, I've got locked down corporate email on my mobile device. I can't open an attachment. So I'll just forward it to my personal email where I can open it. And now I've exposed whatever that data is to, you know, the security environment of my personal device, right? which is exactly the opposite of what the, the, you know, security team was trying to accomplish with the, the locked down email program. And I'll space. give you an example of a, of a story about exactly where that once went wrong, uh, which was with a transatlantic phone call between um, American police, and I think it was either Irish or British law enforcement officers. And so there was going to be a late night phone call. And so let's say, well, let's say he was British. And so the British policeman actually forwarded the invite to the conference call to his personal email address so that yeah. he could log in at like 10 o'clock at night or whatever. And what those guys did not know 
was that the hacking group who they were actually discussing on that conference call tuned in to the conference call and they then <laughs> they then <laughs> they then released an audio recording of the police folks from the states and britain discussing their hacking group and they posted it up on twitter now those guys were eventually caught uh for, for doing that but you know that's the audaciousness but it really underlines the the point that even if this can happen to law enforcement where they're sending what might seem as harmless as a link to a conference call which someone needs to connect to to outside the company there could be someone else who's actually hacked into that account and yeah. uh, might be tuned in as well it occurs to me that that with with security awareness we're we're really in many ways fighting a conf, uh, a type of confirmation bias right everybody understands the the threats that are out there but they have a hard time believing that it could happen to them yeah um you know yes that phone might be compromised but my phone isn't compromised yeah uh it, it is something that we suddenly can be guilty of i mean the situation now of course is actually we have all been breached multiple times. I mean, chances are, you just go to haveibeenpwned.com and enter your email address there, and Troy Hunt's database will tell you how many data breaches you have been involved in in the past. And there is the potential that your computer has been infected, whether at home or in the office. Um, it's It's not as rare as it used to be. When I started in this industry, some people really thought that viruses and the like were urban myths. In fact, I think it was Peter Norton before Norton Antivirus was ever released who said uh, viruses are like the alligators in the New York sewers. He said it's just an urban <laughs> myth. <laughs> then, then I suppose out he had Norton. a change of heart. <laughs> yes, then he had a change of heart. Um, I'm sure uh, he no longer has that opinion of the chaps at Semantic don't either. But uh, it... Yeah, it, it is something. I mean, I, I'm living in this world, you're living in this world, so we sort of learn to be paranoid all of the time. But I think for many people, it is something which they forget about unless they're regularly reminded with awareness sessions, with training. That's one of the challenges, I think, with training your staff and raising awareness is keeping it fresh and realizing you don't just do this when you induct people into the organization. You need to do it all of the time. And you need to... Uh, you need to regularly refresh the content so it doesn't become dull. Well, yeah, and you have to tell them what's changed because the yeah the techniques change, right? The attackers' techniques. They do, and you know we we've, we've seen things like new developments, uh, like for instance, crypto jacking and and so forth, DNS hijacking, the IoT you know, the devices. That, the one that worries me are the the deep fake uh, voice calls. Oh. You know the the wire transfer scam where you get a call from your boss and it sounds like your boss. It's right. extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, but of course, through those kind of scams, there are so many tens of millions which those scammers could potentially make out of it that they may well put that kind of effort in to make them sound particularly convincing. And I think generally, as a community, uh, those of us who work in IT, we're, we're, we're more suspicious of emails because we're so bombarded all the time by phishing emails and scam right. emails and the like. But as soon as you get a phone call, you just turn into a regular friendly human and you begin offering information and you don't like to cause a scene. You're very comfortable deleting an email or sending it into the spam bin. It's less comfortable telling someone, you know, who the hell are you? Why, how did you get my number? Well, it's, it's just an awkward thing to do on the telephone or indeed face to face. But some of these fraudsters will use those kind of techniques yeah i think the uh the the phone call the voice call scam has has some limiting factors though i think there may be a generational limit there with people who who simply don't answer phone calls anymore. <laughs> uh, it, it can't right. it can't catch you if you don't answer the phone you'll just get a slack message or whatever it is or tiktok a, that a will be the next a reply yeah exactly <laughs> exactly well so i i think there's a it, you know, at the end of this conversation, there's there's kind of a million dollar question or multi million dollar question, which is, what difference does does this security awareness work make? And, and this is something I always struggle with, not with just security awareness, but with information security in general. Right? We've been in this industry for twenty plus years, and I don't think we can say that things have gotten better. So, are these efforts to make people aware making a real difference? And and how can we tell if they are? I don't know I'd agree with you about things not getting better. I hate to be too downbeat. I mean, certainly cybercrime has exploded like never before. But we have a situation now where the average man in the street, if you use the words identity theft with them, 
they know what you're talking about. And I would think 10 years ago, identity theft would sound like something from a science fiction novel, and they just look at you blankly. But now they begin to understand about fraud. And I think people, because they have had bad experiences, either personally or inside the office as well, I think they are becoming more aware of these things. And the good news is that more and more companies do have defences in place. Sure, they're not perfect to keeping them updated and patched and protected, but you know, it's, I don't think it's all bad news. And awareness can p play its part as well in terms of raising awareness. I mean, I, I think we've seen some real good benefits, not only on the individual level, but also in the corporate level. Uh, I'll give you an example. There was a lot of talk just a few years ago, of course, about all this nation state hacking that was going on uh, between different countries and particular people from, for instance, the Middle East being investigated and people wanting to know what that. And I heard about a Canadian company who had heard about various organizations being hacked, and their information being stolen. And because of that awareness, because they'd seen the headlines, they thought, you know what, we better find out if we've been hacked. We better investigate because we could potentially be a target. And this particular company, I think they were in the business of regularly helping people move from Egypt to Canada, and they helped with some of their uh, legal requirements as they were doing that. And they thought, potentially, we could be an organization that was hacked. And so they did the normal thing. They scanned their network, and they didn't find anything particularly suspicious there. But they then asked a consultant, would you mind having a look on the dark web for us and see if any of our data is out there? And um, because of the awareness that had happened because they'd seen the headlines this consult and they'd asked this chap to do this this consultant went out onto i can't remember it's probably like the silk road or one of those sites where uh, cyber criminals were offering their services and what they found was not only their data was up there for sale but they found you could actually subscribe for monthly updates on information which was being stolen from a their service. corporate network yeah it was a service which was being offered by the criminals. And then, obviously, once they found out this was going on, they were able to properly investigate um, how their systems had been compromised and hopefully lock them out forever. But that would never have happened if there hadn't been the headlines and news stories about other companies being hacked. So sometimes those news stories aren't just read with a sense of schadenfreude and thinking, oh, you know, you know, pleased it happened to them rather than us. But it actually stirs people into taking proper action and discovering that they've got a problem too. And that's something which I think is really good. Oh, that's my hope. I mean, every time I see a, you know, a publicly available S3 bucket uh, breach, <laughs> I just think, I hope at least one company out there says, maybe we should check the configuration of our Amazon S3 buckets. It's just and the lamest thing in the world, isn't it? If I was a security researcher, I'd be almost embarrassed reporting on, I found another Amazon S3 bucket and properly protected. Because it's just like, and another one, and another one. And obviously, Amazon has done things to try and make that less likely. But there clearly are still so many organizations which have left the data available to anyone, no password required. It, it, it's so depressing. So I share your hope that at least one organization each time is thinking, hmm, I wonder if that could be happening to us as well. So we, I mean, it, it's easy for us to share anecdotes about how awareness drives some change. My core question is, is how do we get to a point where it's no longer anecdotal data, but, but some real data that says awareness is, is working? And I, I, don't, I don't really see a path to do that. No, and I'm not sure I do either. It may be for bigger brains than mine to work out how we actually quantify this and whether it's working. But at the same time, even if we can't put a number on it, it feels to me like this is something that's worth doing. Now, there's a, there's a lot of things when it comes to computer security where it can be hard to quantify your success. I think this is one of the challenges for IT teams generally is that if you're doing a really good job, there's nothing to report to the to the bosses. Yes. And the bosses will think, That's well... That's a classic problem. Yeah, the bosses will think, well, we'll reduce your budget because we didn't have any security incidents last year. It's like, well, you know, the reason we didn't was because we had all these defenses in place. Um, so so it is a challenge, but um, I, I really hope more and more organizations uh, do recognize that there is a benefit to doing this as well as the traditional security measures as well. I do too. I do too. 
All right. Well, I think we're at the end of our, our time here. And uh, Graham, I really want to thank you for joining us. I think it was a, an interesting and enlightening conversation. And uh, I appreciate your perspective. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. To all our listeners, thank you for joining us as well. I hope it was an interesting and enlightening conversation for you and that you uh, tune into the next episode of the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thanks. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.